Until recently, it was only the really weak companies in sick industries like airlines and steel that tried to renege on their pension promises to their workers. Today, perfectly healthy companies like Verizon and IBM are deciding they can no longer afford the pension plans they've been offering. Why is this happening? And what does it mean to you and to our society generally? I'm Sarah Bartlett, and this is our topic today on USA, Inc. Joining us today is Karen Friedman, Policy Director of the Pension Rights Center in Washington, D.C. Karen, thanks for being here today. It's terrific being here as well. Nice to see you. We um, are in a very unusual situation with the pension world right now. Up until now, as you know, there's been a lot of problems in the airline industry and the steel industry, sort of the, the less healthy industries. But there's a new development in, with healthy companies. I wonder if you could just explain what's going on. Yeah. In recent months, we've seen companies like Verizon, IBM, the companies that used to lead the way in having the best business practices, suddenly say, hey, we're freezing our pension plan for all workers. And employees see this as a real broken promise to them. They see it as a betrayal. We've gotten 400 letters from Verizon employees just in the last month saying things like, I feel like this is a kick in the stomach. I feel like a knife in the back employees feel betrayed. When you say freezing the plan, can you just explain what that means? Yeah, it means basically that what the company does is it stops the pension plan at that moment. By law, they have to pay people everything they've earned up until that date, but if you continue working for the companies, you don't get any more pension benefits. So for older employees in particular who've worked for companies all their lives with the expectation of getting a pension based on all the years of work and final pay, they'll end up with much less than they expected. We've heard from, again, Verizon employees who are telling us they're gonna lose as much as $400,000 in pension benefits. So the thing that I like to say to people is the people that we're hearing from are white collar salaried employees. These are the people who are running companies, often management. If companies are doing this to them, imagine what's happening to the low-wage workers. So what we're seeing is a real change in corporate attitudes, and it's going to have a huge and devastating impact on how people retire. Now, why is this happening? Why suddenly would healthy companies be doing this? Well, it's cost. Companies are basically cutting costs on the back of workers. Um, companies like Verizon and IBM, are saying things like, we have to do this because otherwise we can't compete in the global economy. Well, this is what employees say. How come they're cutting our benefits? At the same time, CEOs are getting these huge increases in executive compensation. We're not seeing, it's not an, a, an equal playing field here. Also, Verizon showed a $9 billion profit in 2004. IBM, IBM showed an $8 billion profit in the same year. So employees are saying, you don't have to do this. You know, why are you doing this? So it's becoming a huge issue. Now, I wanna also put this in perspective though, Sarah. While Verizon and IBM and other companies are doing this, I just read an industry study that shows that of the 500 companies that were surveyed, a large percentage, percentage of them, two thirds, are not changing their pension plans. And in fact, 9% of those that were surveyed said that they were gonna improve benefits. So there are companies out there that are still keeping their plans, that are doing the right thing. The challenge now is how do we keep companies in those pension plans, and how do we protect employees' rights? Now, if, if I was an IBM uh, executive, I, I'd want to have my two cents here, and I would say, well, but we, we are recognizing that the world is changing, and we're setting up a 401k plan, and we're making extremely generous contributions that are way ahead of everybody else. So on balance, this is a positive thing, because now individuals can control their own investments for their retirement. What, what's wrong with that? Well, let's put it this way. IBM used to have both a 401k and a defined benefit plan. They already started making changes in their plan back in 1999. They switched to a, it's a kind of complicated issue, but they switched to another kind of inferior plan. And because of the protests 
of their white collar employees, they changed it and they made sure that their older employees could stay under this pension plan. IBM is breaking a promise now. They said that they were going to keep their defined benefit plan for these workers. They said they were committed to the system and they've changed their minds. From employees' perspective, this is a broken promise. And so we've got to do something about this in the country. Well, I think, again, just to take the other point of view, um, how do they compete um, on a level playing field if their global competitors don't offer these kind of generous pension plans? How, well, how do they stack up against them? Well, it's interesting. I mean, there's, there's two different ways of looking at this. Um, we've started to have conversations with people of all different perspectives on this. And the question needs to be asked, can companies stay competitive with good pension plans? We hope that the answer is yes. There's plenty of companies that still have these pension plans and are competitive. And keep in mind that pension plans are a way for companies to keep and retain good workers. It helps keep uh, workers' morale up. Ultimately, it's good for business. But you know, something I read recently that I think is pretty compelling is that in some of our industrialized, uh, in some of our competitors who are industrialized companies, they have nationalized health care. So, you know, there are people that are saying, well, for companies to compete, maybe what we need to do is nationalize, you know, health care costs and maybe come up with mandatory pensions. Well, we have a social security system, of course, which to some degree is supposed to help. Um, well, social security, let's keep in mind. I mean, I think there's a lot of myths about social security. I think there's been such a drumbeat over the last numbers of years where people think, oh, social security is going bankrupt. And definitely the people who are watching today need to know that social security is a good and sound system that's provided benefits to virtually every American family. And Social Security has enough money to pay full benefits until 2042. That's hardly a crisis. But Social Security, even though it is a good system, we have to keep it strong. We can't privatize. Social Security has only was, was structured to only provide a minimum level of benefits to ensure that people have something in the bottom. But it's always been the case that we expect that people are going to have savings and pensions above that. And what's happening is that now people are being left with only one, they used to call it the three-legged stool, people have one leg, which is Social Security. And a very a high percentage of Americans only live on Social Security. That's not enough. For the typical retiree, Social Security provides about $11,500 a year, which is equivalent to the federal minimum wage. So pensions have been what's created a middle class among retirees in this country. If we see pension plans go, we're also going to see the middle class go. So this is a big issue. The other point I want to make, Sarah, because I think it's important for people to know, pensions provide great retirement benefits for people, but they also have been an engine for the economy. And In pensions have, well, pensions have created probably the biggest and most significant amount of savings. It's also the largest lump of money for, for investment capital. So the question is, if we lose the pension system, does that have economic implications? And enough economists seem to think, yes, it will. Do you think that um, any changes in the accounting system have been behind some of this recent cutting back? I mean, is that is that part of what's going oh, on here? Oh, absolutely. First of all, let me put something else in perspective, which I think a lot of people don't really know. Back in the 1990s, most companies had surplus assets, meaning they had much more money in their pension funds than they needed to pay benefits. And because of accounting rules in those days, companies could actually use the pension surpluses to boost income in the company. So in the 1990s, you didn't hear companies complaining about their pension plans because of, because of accounting rules. They were able to sort of manipulate the, um, the you know, not, they couldn't take it, but they were able to sort of manip manipulate the assets on paper and it helped the company. Well, suddenly 2001 hits, stock market goes down, interest rates go down, and suddenly, oh, look, we have to put money in our pension plans. So because those liabilities also show up on the bottom line, a lot of shareholders and CEOs are under pressure to change or stop the plan. There's also a, a, a um, new accounting rules that are being proposed and are probably going to be implemented 
that's even going to make companies put more of their pension liabilities on the bottom line. Well, why is that? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Depends if you're an investor or if you're an employee, presumably. Well, also, though, keep in mind, pension plans are meant to be funded over the long haul. So that even though a company has to pay benefits today and that liability shows up, it's not like they have to put all that money in today. But it's because investors are looking at this as being, because we're, we're in a time right now where all companies care about is that short-term profit. So if we can get rid of the pension plan today, isn't that great? For instance, IBM was able to show a $3 billion you know, profit, basically, because they're going to be freezing the plan. Well, what's that mean for society at large? What's that going to mean for employees? Ultimately, is it going to have a, a bad impact on employers, employees, and society? So we've, we've got some tough issues to wrestle with. Again, just from the narrow perspective of somebody who had bought IBM stock, if that um, they probably are happy about this because suddenly it looks as if IBM is doing much better and the stock goes up. And so there is some portion of our society that might feel this is a good thing. Well, let's keep in mind that a lot of the same workers who are getting hurt are also investors in the company. So that isn't the case. And also, we've got to change investor attitudes then. I mean, if, if all we're doing is pumping up short-term profit by cutting benefits, that may you know, give the, the uh, company the short-term spike, but what's the long-term implications? The long-term implications are that employees are not going to be happy. Um, you know, the company over time, you know, will these companies remain competitive? It, these are these are big questions. Do you think this is going to be very widespread? I mean, this is going to the, the, the Verizons and the IBMs are going to well already. Us? I you know you see GM is freezing its plan uh, for new entrants and also cutting back on some of the retiree health. Sprint has done it. Uh, you know we have to do something about it. And Congress has legislation that they're looking at now. But that legislation is mostly dealing with underfunded pension plans. It's not dealing with this new issue of healthy companies with healthy plans that are suddenly saying, sorry, we don't want this anymore. And this is, this is the next issue that Congress has got to deal with. We will be right back. The Zicklin School of Business at Brew College of the City University of New York is the largest and most diverse accredited business school in the United States, offering high-quality, full-time and part-time degree programs at the undergraduate, master's and Ph.D. levels. For information about the Zicklin School of Business, please visit our website, zicklin.baruch.cuny.edu. That's zicklin.baruch.cuny.edu. Welcome back. I'm speaking with the Policy Director of the Pension Rights Center in Washington, D.C., Karen Friedman. Hi. We talked about the um, impact that you think this is going to have. Can you sort of paint a picture for us of, of what you know about the, the way the elderly and the, um, in our society are living now and what you think that the impact will be on us as a, as a country? Well, already, you know, we, we do still have um, millions and millions of retirees that are living solely on Social Security and they're ba barely making ends meet now. For the people that are doing well, they're typically the people who have had a pension in their company. So if you fast forward 10 years or 20 years and these, and these companies are more and more cutting back, changing plans, telling people to save for themselves, the future looks dim. And especially if there's a tax on Social Security. I mean, we've got to keep Social Security strong. It has been the best poverty pre prevention tool that we have in America today. I mean, you know, back before Social Security, there were droves of elderly who were homeless and on the streets begging. You don't see that anymore. But unless we do something now to strengthen the private pension system and ensure that people have enough money when they, when they retire, we're going to have a, a huge amounts of poverty in the future. People won't be able to make ends meet. And, and I mean, look at what's going on right now. The public policy um, kind of philosophy right now is the ownership society. It's telling people, you're on your own. Go ahead. You know, that's the, we, we, everybody has to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. Meanwhile, what's that mean? Education costs are going up. People are being piled with education debt. Health care is going up. More and more companies are cutting back on health care and, and popping the cost onto individuals, mm -hmm. and not to mention the 40 million workers that don't have any health care. And then if we're doing the same thing in the pension arena, and we're basically saying, oh, you know, we're going to set up a 401k plan. Maybe we'll match your contribution, maybe not. 
go ahead and save for yourself. Well, how is a typical family, a, a middle class or low and moderate you know, wage earning family, how are they gonna do all that? They're already strained under all of these other things. The first thing to go is gonna be the pension, which is why you do see with statistically when people change jobs, they often take out their 401k money. Because 401k plans, while a good device for supplemental saving, were never meant to be the whole enchilada. And a lot of people pull that money out when they need it. So what's gonna happen down the line? If people are spending all their 401k money for other purposes, you're not gonna have adequate income, and that's gonna be a societal problem that we're gonna to have to deal with. If we don't deal with it now, we're gonna to have to deal so with it So it's not later. like we're getting rid of the problem. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing that some people will just simply try to keep working, and they'll work later into their lives than they were expecting to. Well, that's, uh, you know, there, there was a, a piece I saw recently which was actually a parody of the whole situation where, where they were saying, oh, the new company pension is work until you die. <laughs> but, the, but the fact is, for some people, they can do it. You know, you're a lawyer, you're a doctor, you enjoy what you're doing, but what about the factory workers? What about service employees? People who are doing health care in nursing homes who are already making minimum wage. These are people already who have two jobs. They're not going to be able to work indefinitely. What are we going to do about those people? Well, what are we going to do? I mean, are there some ideas being floated around in Washington to try to address this? Well, there's, a, there's an emerging consensus among stakeholders of all different sides of the issue that we need to do something to, number one, preserve the plans that now exist and make sure that people's rights are protected. Number two, we have to come up with new kinds of plan designs. Maybe try to get companies, if they don't like the old style traditional plans, they say it's too expensive, let's come up with new hybrid forms that kind of combine the best parts of employer paid pensions and what your, your viewers need to know that they're, what's the difference between a pension plan and a 401k plan in a pension plan, you get the employer takes the risk, uh, you get a guaranteed lifetime benefit, um, and you're not going to outlive live your assets. Under a 401k plan, an employee puts in the money, maybe a company puts in money, um, the employee has all the risk, and you get whatever, however well you do. Um, the Big difference. Yeah, <laughs> and the statistics are showing that people aren't saving enough. So I think I've seen something that half of the 401k plans have fewer, less than twenty thousand dollars. Yes, them. that is correct. That in fact, um, for half of all 401k accounts, fifteen thousand dollars, and for those people between uh, forty-five and fifty-four, it's about twenty-three thousand. So think about it's that. A what can a what, what can twenty-three thousand dollars buy you for retirement? It's going to be a latte, in, you know, <laughs> in twenty years. I mean, you're right. I mean, it's it's not enough. So we've got to come up with new kinds of plan designs. We've got to keep employers in the system. And um, I've been doing this initiative called the Conversation on Coverage. I've brought together lots and lots of people of different sides to talk about all these new ideas, everything from these new kinds of hybrid plans to maybe a centralized system of individual accounts above Social Security, new ideas for small businesses. Outside of that initiative, people are, are, are starting to talk about a mandatory system at some point because the fact is, we can't just shrug our shoulders, say it's enough to put all the burdens onto individuals. It's not policy. That's wishful thinking. Are there people in Congress that are t trying to take the lead on this? Well, there's definitely, you know, you could talk to everybody and they think they're taking the lead on it. It's a question of what the lead is. Um, you know, right now there's two bills before Congress that are mostly dealing with issues of underfunding. And one bill has passed the House, won the Senate, and they're getting ready to reconcile those two bills. There's a lot of questions on that. It's bipartisan, but there's a lot of questions on whether it's gonna help or hurt. In terms of the freeze issue, there's a lot of ideas out there. One idea that I think would be a, at least symbolically important would be to say, look, if you're cutting your workers' pensions, then you should freeze your executive compensation. But we also need some um, carrots besides sticks. So we, we should be coming up with new incentives to keep employers in these plans, give them additional tax breaks. Um, I think there's a lot of dialogue now. People don't have the, the solution yet, but there's, there's a, right now a lot of discussion going on. How about labor unions? I mean, they must have, they have a great stake in this. Are they, do they have some ideas? Are they coming up with pr programs for their employee, you know, they, their members essentially? Well, you know, unions really are the, the, the best reason for having a union in this country. And being, being in the union is that you get a pension. I mean, it's probably the last sector in the economy where people have good pensions. Look at Verizon. It's the salaried workers are getting hurt. 
not the union employees. And the union employees are, you know, concerned. They're working with the salaried employees right now, actually, to, to help them out because every, you know, once they hit the salaried workers, unions can be hurt. But yeah, the unions are out there trying to fight for, for you know, good protections. And in the public sector, is this? Do you see the same thing sort of looming? The same problems looming? Well, with state and local employees. Well, in the public sector, you know, you've seen in a lot of situations where um, public sector workers, uh, the they have underfunded pension plans in a lot of situations, so there's been an outcry in the press saying, oh, you know, public sector workers, taxpayers are paying for these benefits, but what people need to understand is they are setting a, a higher standard. They, their standards shouldn't be lowered. The private sector should be following the public sector because everybody should have good pensions. We shouldn't be cutting back the good pensions that now, you know, public sector workers are, are getting. They're in an enviable position, and we've got to keep those. It sounds um, so, like something everybody could get behind, that everybody should have a good pension. And, but I keep coming back to the, the corporate response, which is it, it just simply costs too much money. If we do that, we will erode our competitive position, and there won't be a company 20 years from now to hire anybody, let alone offer them pensions. And I, I find it hard to believe that they're all just making that up. I mean, I think that's a legitimate issue. Well, I think it is a legitimate issue. As I said before, uh, our, some of our industrialized competitors, you know, have nationalized services, which, which helps them out. But also, we've got to come up with ways to address that issue. I mean, I think that there needs to be dialogue. There needs to be studies on how companies that have these good pensions um, can remain competitive. Because, in fact, uh, I've seen at least one study that has shown that employees that have these plans are better employees, they're happier, they, they work harder. And I can't imagine that um, having a good workforce that builds a company doesn't help your position in the, in the global economy. Also, you know, we, you know, companies like IBM and Verizon, they should be leading the way to the top, not leading the race to the bottom. Because if we, if we just use that rationale for everything, Sarah, what's that going to be? Oh, well, we can't offer good health care. Oh, we can't offer good wages. We can't offer anything. So where are people going to be? So we've got to address, that's the central issue, we've got to address it head on. Do you think that there uh, will be political fallout from this if you see CEOs continuing to get these massive pay scale uh, increases in stock option grants and uh, and, and then w at the same time, I mean, I thought it was significant that the General Motors uh, chief executive took a 50 percent pay cut. Are we, are we starting to get into a world where people are more politically sensitive to all of this? Well, certainly think? I think it's the right thing for CEOs to do. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, this, is, this already is becoming a big political issue. I think the idea in employees we hear from think it's outrageous, the, dis the disparity between what a, a typical worker gets paid and a CEO with their compensation packages, I mean, it's pretty outrageous. And so I think employees do feel, hey, you know, if you're going to cut costs on our backs, then there should be some parity here, and, and, and CEOs and, 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 and others should not be getting the kinds of executive pay that they're getting. But yeah, this is, I mean, when you start having salaried workers be the ones that are out there starting the revolution, you know, I've got green panted, IZOD wearing you know, former management people from big companies who are their HR directors, literally ready to go to hit the streets. When you have that happen, that's a societal problem, and that's going to and that's going to translate into political power and into political change. Well, and I think, as you said, if we don't address this now, we're going to have to address it later. It's not that the problem can just be sort of swept under the carpet. I've been fortunate to have Karen Friedman, policy director of the Pension Rights Center, as my guest today. Thank you, Karen, for being on the show. Thanks, Sarah. Anytime. This is a, a great pleasure. We'll be right back. Some people think of New York as the world's second home. The City University of New York, with students coming from 90 countries and speaking more than 155 languages, is the world's first university. Find us on the web at cuny.edu or call us at 1-800-CUNY-YES. The termination of pension benefits by healthy companies is the final blow to the social contract that has governed the relationship between employers and employees for the last half century. The bottom line is, if you have any interest in retiring at a reasonable age and living a half-decent life as a senior citizen, you must save money yourself 
and not rely on either Social Security or your company's pension promises. The Bush administration has sought to portray the shifting of risk to individuals as a virtue, since it seems to offer us more freedom in how we invest our savings. However, the overall impact will be that more people will have to delay retiring and more of our senior citizens will be impoverished. The interesting question is, how will this play out politically? If healthy companies terminate pension plans at the same time as they reward their chief executives with multi-million dollar pay packages, stock option grants, and supplemental retirement benefits, as they have been doing, this could ignite a political backlash, the likes of which we can only begin to imagine. For USA Inc., I'm Sarah Bartlett.